In this lecture, I'm going to take you through the topic of media and crime. And what we're going to look at is we're going to look at some of the ways that the media represent crime um, and different people within the criminal justice system in both fictional um, media, movies, TV shows, books, etc., as well as the press or factual crime. And that can include uh, documentaries, true crime um, podcasts and TV shows and things like that. So we're going to discuss the idea as, as to whether or not the media gives a distorted view of crime within society. And finally, looking at if media is a cause of crime or a cause of the fear of crime. Now, there are some links here going back to labelling theory, moral panics, um, and gender and crime and ethnicity and crime, etc. So it might be an idea just to have a quick glance over that, just to remind you for as we're going through this lecture. So we're going to start off by looking at fictional crime and how different groups are represented within fiction. So we're talking TV, movies, books, um, magazines, graphic novels, all of those sort of things. Um, and we're going to look uh, in particular at criminals, the police and victims and how they are represented. And we are talking stereotypes here and there always will be exceptions to the rule and there will be examples that don't quite fit because the media is always trying to find a new thing. They're trying to come up with a new way of looking at things so that it is new and exciting and people want to watch it. So we are talking quite generalised here and in, in terms of general um, representations. So we first off talk about criminals because the criminal um, representation is very multifaceted in that criminals are viewed in very different ways. One of the first ways that they are um, representatives as the master criminal, the, the super villain, if you like. And I've chosen James Moriarty here as an example, um, just to kind of exemplify it, but it could also be um, Dr. No from um, James Bond. Uh, and the, these kind of super villains who kind of don't really do anything themselves, they, they manipulate and get others to do it for them but they're very very clever very superior so for example with uh, moriarty this the villain from sherlock holmes and sherlock holmes's nemesis is the idea that he is just as intelligent as sherlock holmes but he uses that intelligence for evil and for crime rather than for good You've then got the complete opposite to that, which is the incompetent criminals, the, the kind of slapstick criminals who are um, trying to be trying to be successful criminals. And you kind of watch them and think, how are they? How, how do they not end up in prison? And my example here is the wet bandits from the Home Alone films. Um, and they are represented in the films as being heartless um, criminals, thieves, breaking into houses at Christmas. Um, I'm talking Home Alone 1 here, not Home Alone 2. Um, but they're thwarted by a prepubescent boy. Um, and let's face it if, it, if they had actually had to deal with any of those um, instances that uh, Kevin McAllister put forward, they would have died. There is no way they would have survived that house of horrors <laughs> that Kevin McAllister put together. But even without that, they are seen as being quite stupid um, and incompetent as criminals. Um, so how and they, they and I believe in the film, they've, they've just come out of prison as well. Maybe that's Home Alone 2. I can't remember. Um, you've then got your psychopaths. So this is where people get their idea of what a psychopath is. And, and my example here is um, Dexter Morgan from the TV show Dexter, who is a blood spatter analysis for the police, but also goes around killing people who um, the justice system doesn't um, 
find guilty that the, the justice system lets off and he doesn't see a problem with what he's doing he, he, he kind of sees himself as a um a, a, almost a vigilante but um throughout the whole thing he is a diagnosed um psychopath he is somebody that um doesn't really understand other people's emotions we also see this in a lot of slasher movies and and serial killer movies that these people don't quite get human emotion um or how to empathize with others and finally we've got the planners now my example here is oceans eight um and it could be either ocean any of the oceans films really but it's kind of the minute planning the multi-stepped heist um who somebody who thinks of every kind of contingency and how to get around those contingency um but it's it's that kind of planner criminal who who's kind of like somebody you kind of admire for their organizational skills and obviously in oceans eight you've got um the heist at the met gala uh, in oceans 11 it was a, a casino and lots of people involved lots of multifaceted elements to it and it doesn't look like they're going to get away with it but then they do and you kind of feel good for them because they're getting away with they get they, the plan works and there's lots of twists and things that you don't really see which makes it entertaining but it gives the impression of criminals being and in this links into um theories of crime demons of being rational planners next we look at the victims and how fictional media um shows the victims now classically we see victims of crime in tv shows and movies as being the helpless female now one of the good thing one good thing to watch is perhaps um scream because they actually deconstruct and and break down some of those cliches of horror films like the um slutty friend who who dies quite early on because she's a slut um and I, I, there's n promiscuous is probably a better word but um you've got the jock who croaks quite early because he's not a very nice person he's a bit of a jerk um but generally what we see in those films is the hapless heroine she she's kind helpless heroine sorry not hapless helpless heroine who is being targeted by the criminal who's being targeted by the serial killer or whoever it is um and she's she needs other people to help her she need she's looking for other people to help her um now we we are seeing a change in this and there's been quite a few films that have come out with strong female characters rather than being the victims of crime and that links into our next victim next victim profile which is the vigilante male and my example here is the punisher the punisher's family is killed by drug dealers so he goes on a rampage killing people trying to get to the people that killed his family um and you see that in wrath with john travolta you see it in um standing tall with the rock um there's lots and lots of examples of men who when being victimized by crime instead of becoming helpless like women do they tend to become violent and aggressive and go on a vigilante rampage although recently there have been a number of films particularly where we see women becoming the vigilante um there's the jennifer garner film peppermint where her family are killed in a drive-by and they just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time but they're, they're killed in a drive-by shooting and um she comes back as a um vigilante and is basically shooting people and um the pe the judges and the police officers who allowed the pe the um criminals to get away with the, uh, the murder of her family um and we see it there's uh what was the name of the other film 
There's one with um, Jennifer Lopez, where she's a victim of domestic abuse and her hus- she runs away with her child and her, hus- her ex-husband finds her. But rather than running again or turning to authorities or anything like that, she, she trains and ends up um, killing him. Um, so we are seeing more and more kind of vigilante females. But there again is that view that if you're a victim of crime, then you then people become these violent PTSD driven um, vigilantes. We also see that victims of crime quite often in kind of police procedurals where they are ethnic minorities and also they're innocent so that they're they haven't done anything wrong. They are perfectly innocent angels and we can't say anything bad about them. So the, the dis, dis, depiction, let's speak, uh, the depiction of fictional crime victims, again, is quite stereotypical and doesn't, and, and it kind of presents this kind of like, if you're a victim of crime, you're, you're a sweet, innocent little angel, which we know is not always the case. Finally, let's look at how the police are um, represented in fictional crime. And again, this is quite a binary way of looking at the police force fictionally. You've got the super intelligent um, police officers, the Sherlocks, who can see things that other people can't see. The Temperance Brennans from from Bones, um, Dr. Spencer Reed in Criminal Minds. Um, are all examples of these super intelligent people who who see things that the normal human doesn't see. And then you get uh, Poirot is another example, Poirot um, by um, Agatha Christie. And then you've got the bumbling idiot. So these are the police officers who you just kind of look at and kind of go, how did you get your man? How, how, how did this work? So I've used the example of um, Inspector Clouseau from the Pink Panther films who it, which are slapstick type films but then you've also got Frank Drebin from um not Lethal Weapon um it's a parody of Lethal Weapon I can't remember the name of the film uh, it was a whole series of of films but um he he was kind of again this kind of incompetent bumbling police officer who just happened to manage to get their man but either way that the police is the police are depicted they always seem to get the bad guy at the end of the episode at the end of the movie the bad guys are um caught and they're put in prison and it all's well in the in the fictional fictional world and even if it's not perhaps at the end of each episode if they've got a running um story and a, a story arc you know at the end of it that the bad guy's going to get his comeuppance the the criminal's going to get his comeuppance no matter whether the criminal is super intelligent or whether the criminal is a bumbling idiot so how does this kind of lead to media distortion so what we're talking about here is how these depictions of criminals really kind of give a fictional view of crime and 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 what crime is actually like so madel talks about over representation so when what we're talking about here is that in fictional media we see far more um murders um and things like that but between he noted that between 1945 and 1985 over 10 billion crime thriller books were sold over 25 percent of tv shows were crime-based shows and over 20 percent of movies were based around criminal activity and that's probably increased a little bit since 1985 so what we're seeing is this over representations of uh serial killers of um criminal activity that can lead to perhaps a fear of crime but it also kind of gives us a a full sense of what criminal activity is like and then you've got Surrettes who talks about the law of opposites and what it, they suggest or what Surrettes suggests is that 
what we see in fictional media is actually the direct opposite of the official statistics. So what we don't see in the media is we in fictional media is we don't see property crime, which is the most prevalent criminal activity in in the statistics, probably because it's not exactly that exciting um, breaking and entering. Um, but we do see an awful lot of violence, drugs and sex crimes. Um, we see murder being driven by greed and calculation when in fact a lot of murders are more spontaneous than that, leading to that belief that murder is a um, rational act. Um, and we see, particularly with sex crimes, we see a lot of um, rapes or sex crimes committed by psychopathic strangers when in fact a majority of um, rapes are um, acquaintance rapes. So they're, they're done, they're perpetrated by people the victim already knows, whether it be they've been on a date or their friends or they've met at a party or something like that. A majority of um, rapes are actually acquaintance rapes and stranger rapes are extremely rare and quite often do lead to not being solved due to the fact that there isn't a connection between the victim and the perpetrator. And we also see that um, the police always get their, their criminal. They always get the, the person who the, there's a nice tidy ending to it. And the statistics don't back that up. A lot of crime that is reported and recorded does go unsolved whether that be through lack of evidence or lack of investigation, lack of funding or anything, things like that. It is still the complete opposite to what is actually happening in reality. So why, what, what do we mean? What does the impact of this mean? It, it can lead to a fear of crime from, um, the general populace, so they kind of think, oh God, uh, this could happen to me. Um, it could, you could have that hyper reality from um, the postmodernists who, who, where people are not able to, to differentiate between the fictional criminal activity and, rea and real life criminal activity, particularly with the growing number of true crime documentaries and shows that are being um, put out there. But moving on then to look at factual crime, when we're talking about factual crime, we're talking about the press, we're talking about um, true crime documentaries, podcasts and things like that. So these, this is the media representation of crime that has actually happened. And what we see in their depiction of criminals, we see people who are from the underclass, they tend to be ethnic minorities, they tend to be young and they tend to be men which we can then apply Surrett's law of opposites to because that's actually who are more likely to be a victim of crime rather than a perpetrator of crime. And it kind of creates that that fear of that group, that social group of young um, working class ethnic and minorities because, oh, my God, they might be a criminal and they could attack me kind of view. When it comes to victims, there are kind of two suggestions. You've got the missing white woman syndrome. So if you happen to be middle class, white, female, um, probably a working mum or have a nice family and come from a normal background, you're going to get the press. You're going to get on the news. They're going to have that lovely picture of you with your family. Who And then it's kind of like this poor victim, this poor woman look at what's happened to her okay um we also see a lot when children are victims of crime that again tends to make the news more than the general victims of crime which tend to be 19 to 28 year old young men and this is due to selective reporting and we'll come on to that a bit more in a minute but the the press and the media will be very choosy about what it is that they are going to um, put in the press. So things like um, the Casey Anthony case, where Casey was um, a toddler who went missing and then turned up 
um, dead. That that got a lot of press because she was a very pretty young white toddler. And then it got more complicated because then her mother was accused of the murder and went to trial and was found guilty, but has said that she didn't do it. And um, there was a lot of um, con- kind of controversy and drama around that particular case. Um, another example is John Benet Ramsey, who was found murdered in her her basement, and the perpetrator has never been caught. But again, you've got a very pretty beauty queen pageant um contestant young child who just looks so good on the tv and looks so good in pictures um and it's like how tragic this young this young girl has has been murdered when we're looking at the police the police the representation of the uh, police in factual crime tends to be quite negative they're seen as corrupt, There's pol- they report on pre- police brutality, they're seen as racist and the race, uh, in, in institutionally racist, particularly after the McPherson report in 1999, and they're generally seen as incompetent. And this is something that you, you can link back to the recent COVID situations where um, nurses and the, the medical professionals were kind of angels and let's clap for the NHS and all of that. Um, to start off with, teachers were kind of like, oh, teachers, wonderful people do it, switching to remote learning. And then, of course, we became lazy, um, lazy people who are complaining about being on holiday. I wish. Um, but the police didn't get any of that. They were the ones that were out enforcing the, the lockdown. Um, there were police who ha- were spat at and people kind of telling them that well, I've got COVID and I've spat on you, you're going to get COVID. Um, and they were, they were still treated in a very negative way. Um, so the, the media tends to take quite a negative view of the police and that it's never the kind of hero policeman that we police force that we see. We might see it for individual cases, but in general, it tends to be a negative view. So how does this cause distortion? Well, first of all, Kid, Hewitt and Osborne say that it creates a crime as a spectacle. Um, The media see reporting of a crime as driven by the need for spectacle, the dramatisation of the event. As I said, with the the John... um, Bene Ramsey case where the and the Casey Anthony case where the drama then outweighed the case itself and it, it they argue that these cases become spectacles and in get and are engaging because we're both repelled by the activities but also fascinated by them we're repelled by the fact that somebody murdered this young child but at the same time we're intrigued and we're fascinated by who actually did it. Was it the mother? Was it somebody else? Was it a paedophile? Was it the grandparents? Um, was it the sibling? So as much as we might be feeling um, disgusted by it, how could somebody do that? How That's, that's um, awful. It's horrible. At the same time, we feel... Um, fascinated by it and we want to know the answers and that's why true crime documentaries are so popular you then got postman and yes this is the same postman from um, our study of childhood who says that the media coverage of crime is increasingly a mixture of entertainment and sensationalism as well as information leading to what he refers to as infotainment we don't just want to be told the news we want to be entertained by the news which kind of links into that idea of crime being a spectacle and finally we've got dramatic fallacy from felson who argues that um all the drama and all the speculation surrounding the crimes is put on to get viewers so that rather than being told the facts of the case which might be a little bit mundane the, the reporters will speculate on who did it and why they did it and what the motive was and kind of creating that sense of intrigue which then can lead to a false view of the crime 
okay, that dramatic fallacy. So this links in with the idea of news values. So the media has these values which they um, which helps to determine whether or not something is newsworthy or not. So the list is coming up on the screen here. We've got immediacy of the story. Is it happening now? Dramatization is there action? Is there excitement? Personalization is there a human interest element? Is the victim a young child? Is there um, some sort of oh she's overcome? They've overcome this, that, and the other, and then look at this horrible thing that's happened to them, kind of thing. Um, the higher the status of the victim, the more focus on the story. If it's a celebrity um, who is involved, right? There was a, a, a story the other week about um, Lady Gaga's dogs being stolen, and I, they've been returned now. But that was kind of headline news that her dogs had been stolen, and but there was very little about the fact that the dog walker had been shot. Um, it was all more about the idea of uh, Lady Gaga's dogs being stolen. Um, simplification. Can we discuss this in, sh in black and white? That no shades grey. There's no kind of, well, it's not maybe that bad or, oh, well, there's this and things like that. It's a case of that's the bad guy. That's the victim. That's what happened. It, it's all very clear cut and black and white. Anything involving novelty or unexpectedness, you, you've got entire TV shows dedicated to stupid criminals um, and examples of criminals who have bragged about um, what they've done on social media and then realise that and then suddenly get arrested by the police and seem shocked by that. Um, an example quite recently was a guy who had vandalised some national monuments in uh, New Hampshire in America bragged about it on social media and then was shocked when the FBI turned up and arrested him. Um, risk. So we're talking victim sensitive stories about vulnerability and fear. And if you've got a very um, vulnerable looking victim or victim's family, that can that can increase the news value and violence. More, the more visual, the more spectacular the act, the more likely it is to be. So if the news can see, if, if the press can tick more and more of these story, the, these elements, the more likely it is for the story to get into the press. And that leads to the underrepresentation of property crimes, because let's face it, they're not exciting. Somebody broke into a house and stole a telly. Not exactly um, exciting. Um, an overrepresentation of violent sex crimes and drugs because they are exciting. It exaggerates police success, suggesting that more crimes are solved than um, actually are. Exaggerates the risk of victimization. So it's sort of like showing particular types of victims can suggest to people that they are more likely to be victims. And I suggest that crimes are isolated incidences. So um, that there, there's just it's just this one person, it's just this one thing without looking at the more um, societal and systematic basis of crime. So let's move on then. So we've talked about how the media represents crime, both fictionally and factually. And what we're looking at now is how the media can be blamed for criminal activity, how it can it's suggested that the media can be a cause of crime. Now, this relates to a theory known as the hypodermic syringe model. And this model suggests that as an audience, we are very passive to media messages and the media brainwashes us into believing certain viewpoints, certain information as factual, even when it perhaps isn't. And it suggests that the press control and persuade audiences to act and behave in certain ways. So it's called the hypodermic syringe models because it's almost like we're being injected with the media um, view of life, of society, and we just blindly accept it. And this model it really says that the media therefore causes crime. 
So how does it do that? How is the media a cause of crime? And they identify a number of ways that the media can cause crime. The first is through imitation. And this is the idea that people will act out crimes and the violence and things that they see in the media um, because they think that that's appropriate. An example here is there is a, there was a college student who um, decided after hours and hours and hours of playing Grand Theft Auto on a computer game, he thought, I know what, I'm going to up the ante. I'm going to go and um, do this for real. And he went out and he stole a car and he kidnapped a woman and he was shooting at things and generally causing carnage until he crashed the car. Um, we also, the, in the James Bolger case, but Venables and Thompson tried to say, well, they didn't, their defence said that uh, the reason why they committed this murder was because they'd watched the film Child's Play with the Chucky doll. And in Child's Play, they do these horrible things to the doll, which is possessed by a serial killer's spirit. Um, and the doll keeps getting up and getting up. And Venables and Thompson believed that that's what would happen um, with James Bolger. And there are a number of examples of violent um, criminal activity linked to um, various computer games and movies and things like that. Uh, the Virginia Tech um, massacre where, with, where the student is one of the worst um, school sh uh, college shootings in US history. He'd been playing a lot of computer games and first per uh, it was actually a computer game Doom um, that he practiced shooting on in order to carry out his his murders. Um, so for some people, they see the media as a uh, crime being a, an imitation or a copycat of what is seen in the movies. Um, we've also got arousal. So the idea that what we see in the movies and what we see in the media cause increased adrenaline and endorphins, which lead to people to engage in risky and criminal behaviour. Um, for example, um, there is uh, evidence to suggest that um, on the opening weekend of the um, Fast and Furious films, there are higher rates of speeding and higher rates of traffic violations um, because you and I, I, I admit that there was an element I went to see Fast and Furious 9 I think it was in the cinema and um, driving home about 10 o'clock at night down the A11 looked down at the speedometer and I'm like oh I'm going 100 miles an hour I think I better slow down um, so it, it, that adrenaline, that rush, that kind of um, endorphin rush that you get from watching the, this, the media can lead to um, criminal behaviour. It can um, lead to more risky behaviour that can seep into um, our actual behaviour. You've got desensitisation. So the idea that um, we, we watch violence in the media, we watch horror films, the Saw franchise and, and things like that. And it leads us to being desensitized. Now, for example, with the sh um, Saw films, when the first one came out, it was really shocking. And I remember going to the cinema to see it and thinking, oh my God, this is, this is disgusting. This is really horrible. I watched the most recent, I know sequels are not always the best um, kind of, um, they never quite live up to the hype sometimes. But I've watched the, the more recent Saw films and it's like, eh, seen it, done it. Nothing seems shocking compared to that because watch, watch them and the shock value diminishes the more we get used to it and we're no longer horrified by it. So if we're no longer horrified by it, we're more likely to commit acts of violence ourselves and it's not just about the violence it it's kind of we're no longer shocked and appalled by different things uh, different criminal acts so if we're not shocked and appalled by it we don't see necessarily see the problem as much 
uh, TV shows can act as a school of crime. Um, and what we mean by this is um, people watch the TV shows and they kind of explain how they solve the crimes and the evidence. And if you know what they're looking for, you can not you can um, preempt that sort of evidence. And that then leads to uh, people being able to get thinking that they can get away with crime uh, better because they know what the police are looking for. Um, it can also certain TV shows, so things like um, White Collar and um, Criminal Minds and things like that, they actually talk you through the process of the crime that's being committed. Um, and that can then lead to people kind of going, well, I know how to do that. So things like uh, finding out that um, they can lift shoe prints from carpets using electrostatic uh, collection that uh, they can get saliva from bite marks that can be linked back by DNA or the fact that you have a unique ear print for example every person has a unique ear print all of these things can lead to you to teaching people how to get away with crime or how to commit crime it can also lead to targeting so um, the police the, the, the TV shows and the media show certain groups of people um, to be criminal, um, which can lead to a bit a very small kind of moral panic, which can lead to stereotypes and typifications, which leads to um, more police targeting. Um, the idea of deprivation. So this is kind of relative deprivation. We've got TV shows like Made in Chelsea, The Kardashians, reality TV um, shows like that, where people will see what it is that they these people have and kind of like, well, I want that. Why can't I have that? So that can lead to people um, turning to criminal enterprise to get the lifestyle that they see. And that leads us into the last one, which is glamorization and the idea that TV shows, particularly things like The Sopranos, Narcos, um, White Collar, all these TV shows kind of show a very glamorized view of criminal life, um, which leads people to wanting to emulate it. Drug dealers who have expensive cars and live in nice houses. Um, con men who manage to get very nice things um, and lifestyles from their ill-gotten gains can kind of glamorize that lifestyle and people kind of go well i kind of want that as well which might lead them into criminal behavior however if we look at the evaluation on this the first is slightly obvious if the media was a hypodermic syringe if it did kind of just inject us with beliefs on what is um, criminal, what is not, and we just accept that information and we get the desensitization, the imitation, and all of those things we've just talked about, then we'd all commit crime. And we don't. So they, it can't be as straightforward as saying you see it on uh, monkey see, monkey do kind of thing. Um, it can also lead to sensitization rather than desensitization. So it can make people more aware and more scared of um, these acts and kind of kind of instead of going saw one, oh God, that was horrible. I'm not watching another saw film again it, in, and then going, oh, it's not saw six, not as bad as saw one. Um, it can actually be, no, 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 that's horrible, that's vile, I don't want anything to do with that, and actually put people off more. And finally, there are other theories of media and media effects, such as the uses and gratifications model, which suggest that we, don't, we, we pick and choose what we consume from the media based on what we want and what we enjoy. For example, I really enjoy geology do documentaries. I know I'm sad, we, 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 we know this, um, but I like watching documentaries about natural disasters, volcanoes, the birth of the planet, things like that. I don't like watching um, films with lots of um, sex crimes or um, gratuitous nudity and things like that. that, that doesn't interest me. 
So I will pick and choose what I want to watch based on what interests me and what I want to get from the media. Um, so it, it's not as straightforward as being the meat monkey say monkey do as as the the uses and gratification uh, the um, hypodermic syringe model suggests. And that leads us on to our next section, which is the media as a cause of the fear of crime. So it's not necessarily here we're talking about it not necessarily being the um, what makes people commit crime, but what makes people fear crime. And if you remember back to our um, discussion on uh, victimization, you'll remember that uh, the middle classes are much more likely to be fearful of being a victim of crime than any other social group. And th this comes from the fear of crime cycle, which suggests that the media create a fear of being a victim of crime through their representation of the meat of the victims and the people who are likely to be a victim, the over representation of certain types of crime, violent crime, murder, sex crimes and things like that, which make people fear being a victim. Oh, I don't want that to happen to me. Oh, no, no, no. Um, that fear of crime leads people to spend more time at home. If I'm at home, I'm safe. If I don't go out at night, I can't be a victim of a mugging or an assault. If I don't go out, then people aren't going to break into my house. Because people are spending more time at home, they're consuming more media. They're not going out, they're not socialising, they're watching more um, TV and more, more um, looking at more things on the internet and things like that. Particularly in lockdown where you had people posting and saying, hey, oh, I think I've completed Netflix where they've been stuck at home. So they've just watched more and more TV and more, more, more and more streaming services and things like that. But because they're consuming more media, that generates more fear. So you're scared of being a victim of crime. You watch more TV that creates more fear of you being a victim of crime, which then means that you don't go out even more. And it kind of spirals from that point of view. But what is it about the media that can cause the fear of crime? So there are a number of um, suggestions here. And Shirley Singer and Tumblr, I do love sociologist names, um, suggests that the fear of crime comes from the overrepresentation of certain types of crime. So by having that um, overrepresentation of violent crime, murder, of uh, sex crimes and things like that it creates that fear because people don't want to be a victim of those types of crime that they're, they're they're quite um what's the word not severe but well, they are severe but they're they're, they're crimes where the, the victimization is a lot more severe you've then got stan cohen and we've looked at this this study in this theory before about the idea of moral panics and folk devils and how the media can create these um, moral panics by creating a public anxiety or alarm due to uh, from a problem that um, is threatening the moral standards of society gets blown out of proportion police get involved and start targeting that particular crime because the media is making a big thing of it um, then there's more arrests which feeds into that spot cycle of the moral panic um, and ver um, and legitimizes that moral panic and it creates the groups of people that you need to be fearful of um, whether it be a social groups based on ethnicity or religion whether it be a subcultural group that you need to be fearful of because they've caught they're causing crime they're, they're creating a problem in society and this links with Miller and Riley, who argue that moral panics are used as a form of ideological control. If you create a moral panic where people become fearful of being a victim of crime from a particular social group, it can control behaviour and in some way and can prevent revolution in, in a Marxist sense, because it's saying they're bad, the, the, the folk devil is bad and they're bad for society, so we shouldn't follow them. We shouldn't be involved with them. 
Now, just to give you some examples of some moral panics over the over more recent ones, we, we know about the black muggings in the 1970s. That's the um, policing the crisis by Philip Hall. In the 1980s, there was the moral panic surrounding AIDS and HIV um, and the idea that um, if you uh, used a toilet seat used by a gay person, you were going to get HIV or AIDS and you were going to die a horrible, horrible death um, and lots of misinformation, which really kind of scapegoated and made gay men into this massive folk devil that everyone needed to avoid is like don't shake hands with a gay person you might get aids now we now know that that is not the case and in fact statistics show there are more women um heterosexual women with hiv um than there are gay men in terms of percentage not raw numbers obviously um in the 1980s you had the satanic child abuse moral panic where uh, people were going for um therapy and there were there was a um fashion for uh, regressive hypnotherapy where you'd be um, to, to bring out repressed memories and all these people were coming out with saying that they'd been um, victims of child abuse for satanic cults and things like that which all turned out to be false and, and um, turned out to be um, forced memories so that they were planted memories um, but it, then it was a time of high secularization. So it, it brought people back to the church because you didn't want to be a Satanist. The 1990s saw the video nasties. So the, the horror films and the, the slasher films of the 1990s were considered video nasties. And this links particularly in with the James Bolger case and the um, child's play films, which were actually banned. It's like we shouldn't ban all these films because they're going to turn all our children into murderers and psychopaths and, and things like that. In the 2000s, it was gun crime. Um, and later in the 2000s, you also had Islamic terrorism, particularly after 9-11. Most recently, we've seen a moral panic around guy, uh, knife crime and how all teenagers are running around with kitchen knives in their bags to stab people. Um, and these are not these are not based on pure fiction they are based on perhaps a case or a situation but because the media has gotten a hold of it and they've created this panic surrounding it people then get up um it then gets blown out of proportion and leads to people um the police targeting which verifies the crime and and can create this fear of crime so with the Islamic terrorism in the 2000s and and still to today, there, there are times when people won't sit next to a Muslim on the train or on the bus because they've got a backpack and that backpack might have a bomb. It's, and even as I say it, it sounds so ridiculous. Um, or people won't won't they see a gang of teenagers on the, on the street and they'll cross over the road so they don't have to go through them. Maybe it's the teacher and me, but I just kind of carry on through. Um, but things like that that would that that affect behaviour. However, the, Rob, Mc, McRobbie and Thornton get the name right. McRobbie and Thornton suggest that this idea of moral panics as a way of creating fear of crime is actually quite outdated, and they give five reasons as to why. Uh, moral panics as a cause of the fear of crime perhaps isn't quite as prevalent today as it once was. And this doesn't link into the, the idea of um, desensitisation that we saw in in um, the cause, also the cause of the fear of crime or um, the cause of crime. This thing, this is purely about how moral panics are no longer um, as powerful as perhaps they once were with the, in the 1970s and the 1960s and the first one the reason is the frequency and they argue that there have been there's been such an increase in moral panics that people are no longer bothered by them they're, they're actually kind of going oh right oh yeah so now we need to be worried about knife crime next week it'd be drugs the week after that it'd be terrorists and people just no longer take 
any notice of them as much because the media's always trying to create the next folk devil, the next moral panic in order to sell newspapers. And they also talk about context. Um, in the past, moral panics would scapegoat a group and create the folk devils, but it could, and this is particularly from a postmodernist perspective, there are so many viewpoints and values in society today that it's really difficult to get a majority of society to be against a particular group because people are more have more information available to them they're more perhaps a little bit more tolerant than they perhaps were previously because they have more information and are more aware and and, and we've got the globalized world but with so many viewpoints and so many accepted viewpoints in the world today um, it can be really difficult in order to create a moral panic because you can't create a scapegoat. You can't create a group, uh, a homogenous group that everybody can turn around and kind of go, yeah, but they're, they're evil, they're horrible, they're, they're doing nasty things. There's also reflexivity. Um, because the concept of moral panic is so well known, some groups actually try and create one for their own benefit. So what we're saying here is that particularly politicians will try and create a moral panic which will then benefit them in the future. So particularly ones about knife crime and things like that, where they can manipulate the data to kind of go, look how wonderful we are as a government. We've reduced knife crime, which we said was a horror, really bad problem when we first came to power. And now it's not. Um, so people are aware now that there are groups out there within the media, within the society, and particularly within the moral entrepreneurs who create, try and create a moral panic because it benefits them. Um, and it, it, it's also, there's a difficulty to create a moral panic now because the morals that they are trying to enforce or the, the, the create the panic are so uncertain now that and this links into that idea of multiple viewpoints it's kind of like the, there's more of a view of each to their own as long as it doesn't cause harm rather than they're different to me therefore it's bad and because of that kind of viewpoint it is difficult to create again that homogenous view of that's bad we hate these people they've got to be um dealt with situation and the last one rebound um people are wary of starting moral panics or the media are more cautious about starting moral panics because there's a possibility that it could rebound and bite them on the backside for example and we've talked about this before the uh, john major's back to basics campaign in 1997 i think it was it was either 92 or 97 i can't remember which um where it was all about family values and how um, the degradation of family values because there's a high number of divorces and um, same-sex couples and all that lovely new right type stuff when it then turns out that John Major has been having an extramarital affair with Edwina Curry and various um, MPs were caught in compromising um, situations. There was an MP who was caught having a homosexual liaison in the middle of Clapham Common um, and he was supposed to be a family man and he was married and he had children and um, things like that. So he stood in Parliament and said, yes, family values, family values, heterosexual family uh, families are the best, nuclear family, all of that. And then he gets caught with his trousers down in, the, in Clapham Common um, with another man. And to make matters worse, it was a male prostitute. So there is a perhaps a little bit of caution now about people pointing the finger at other groups and saying they're bad when that group can turn around and just as easily say no you're bad okay because you've done this that and the other so that then covers the view the media and crime topic so we've looked at media representations in both fiction and the press we've discussed um, how media can give a distorted view 
of crime and how they managed to do that. And finally, how media can be both a cause of crime and a fear of crime. So now you go to your um, ISB, you've got your notes grid to go through and just make sure that you can answer the questions on there.